My new book, uh, which will be coming out by the end of this year with Cambridge Scholars Publishing in the UK, uh, <coughs> is, about, is called Human Trans Self-Transcendence in Our Global Social Contact. So it's about our capacity for transcending and, and growing and maturing and so on. Uh, and because this is a, uh, this weekend was about war and peace, uh, there happens to be just one short piece in my book about, directly about war. It's about just war theory. It's called A Note About Just War Theory. So I, I uh, copied that up uh, for you all just because I thought it would uh, fit very well with uh, what we've been talking about. Um, so you'll reread it if you get the book uh, next year when it comes out. Uh, um, so the, uh, we're talking about the future, and, and as David said, no one knows what the future holds. You know, in my, my understanding, and in this new book that I just mentioned, uh, Human Self-Transcendence and Our Global Social Contract, I talk about the power of transformation that's there in all of us, the power of ascending that's there in all of us. And, uh, the whole book is about that in relationship to our global social contract. So, in my view, the, the future that we have is unpredictable in many ways. And it is not something, I don't think, that can be derived from a study of history. They say those who don't, do not know history are condemned to repeat it. And that's true to a certain extent. But also, there are things tr truly new that can enter into history, truly that have never happened before. Truly, never, we have never, in the history of this planet, had the kind of global consciousness that we now have that was accelerated by those photos that began to come back from space in the early 1960s. We all know now, any rational person knows now, we're on this tiny little blue dot, this tiny little planet. And, and, uh, and, and this has, I think this has tremendous, uh, a, a tremendous influence on our, on our transcendence, on our capacity for self-transcendence. I think we're moving to a new consciousness myself. And, and so this, um, Tom was saying before that visionaries are, don't have to fill in the details, but we're trying to fill in many details as we can because we want to uh, uh, create a situation where there are concrete ways that it can happen. The, you know, we just don't want a, a, a disjunction between where we are now and some uh, future. And that's, so that's what this, this PowerPoint presentation is really about. Uh, what we're doing, what the World Constitution and Parliament Association is doing uh, uh, at, to the limit of its resources, which are limited, uh, uh, we're doing our best to, to make things happen in the world, to make uh, awareness of the Earth Constitution happen and so on. So I, I divided this into three parts. First one called outreach. The second called ratification, which only has one slide in it because it means we're, our main purpose is under Article 17 to get the Constitution ratified. And uh, it's possible uh, to be a personal ratifier of it. We have tens of thousands of people uh, who have been personal ratifiers of the Constitution. You can just go online, and I'll show you the website in just a moment, the web address. You can go online and sign up as a personal signatory to the Earth Constitution. And we, and the Constitution allows for organizations to sign up, for regional governments to sign up, for nations to sign up, for, you know, because we're building a world movement to, to ratify the Constitution. Uh, so, under our outreach, my first slide is our logo. You may have seen the logo before, it's on my business card, if you have one of those, uh, but this is the logo in Spanish, right? We, we're uh, uh, 
putting out our material as much as possible in various languages. And, uh, uh, and for Spanish, we've just got a new edition of the Constitution and our manifesto for the Earth Federation in Spanish, updated, being published in Venezuela. Uh, and our intent is to distribute that throughout Latin America. And uh, so we're... Uh, we just founded, uh, a few months ago, uh, our new Global Communications Center and this is the offices of Swami Agnovich. Swami Agnovich is very, everybody that's literate in India knows his name. He's one of the great, uh, he's like Martin Luther King Jr. was in this country. He's one of the great, he's been in jail, in prison many times. He's one of the great leaders against poverty, bonded labor, child slavery. Uh, he's worked with the UN, he's, and he's been all over the world, and he's invited places as the keynote speaker all over the world. Well, he has offered, he has offices in prime location in downtown Delhi, right near where the uh, government is located. Uh, and uh, he has provided these offices for our Global Communication Center. And so we, we uh, uh, will have... We, we hired a young man just out of technical college who can build a website and uh, use social media to get the word out and so on. So this is, this is Amit Paul, one of our vice presidents who is uh, the head of the uh, Delhi chapter and uh, also in uh, of WCPA. Uh, it's a center. Uh, New Delhi is a global center for all the consulates and, and in the world. It's a real center of the possibility for change. India, where, where we have most of our supporters, uh, of course India is a billion people and many great cities in it, uh, but India also, you may remember, was a leader of the non-aligned movement. And India was never part of this Cold War and they don't want this kind of the vision of the world into opposing enemies. And so many government officials in India are sympathetic to what we're doing. And so that's why we're there in Delhi. It's a very, it's a key city for, for global transformation in our view. Uh, we've held uh, a number of conferences over the years, but the last two years we've held uh, Building the World Parliament Conferences. This one was in Pune, uh, hosted by the Maharashtra Institute of Technology, which is a huge <coughs> institution in uh, Pune, India. Uh, these uh, people in this picture, this isn't everybody that was in the conference, but many of them are top educators and scholars uh, who are very influential. A number of them are from India. Uh, who are influential in universities and so on. And, and as we'll see in, in just a minute, uh, we'll have, they'll, they'll be part of, they're part of our educational outreach uh, to get consciousness of the Earth Constitution, study of it, uh, considerations about it into the educational system. Uh, so we promote you know, we promote on our websites, and uh, these are various websites, and it's this one. This one, by the way, was designed by Eric Stetsenier for us. A uh, very nice one, and this one has a the spot where you can uh, sign the Earth Constitution, right, and become a member, uh, join uh, WCPA. Uh, there's no charge for it. You can just get on our mailing list there. Uh, we're working, as I said a moment ago, we're working with educators and educational institutions. Uh, we were host, we were invited, I was invited as the keynote speaker for a educational management uh, uh, um, conference in Jaitapur. Uh, and it was uh, these people, at the, you know, these are some of the people that were at the conference. They had many breakout sessions and so on. And uh, so our work is getting recognized by educators. It was educators that, you know, this is the uh, part of a um, commonwealth 
take off the R, you've got the Commonwealth. The former British Commonwealth has, it, in all of its former uh, colonies, has a, a giant educational association, and they're aware of our work. And uh, some of them, uh, like some of the people here, want to promote that in their educational operations. And this, uh, this happens to be uh, uh, another uh, uh, university in uh, India that I spoke at that has a number of supporters. And I put that particular photo there because it's a Muslim university and uh, the world constitution, uh, the people that support us around the world are from every faith including no faith, but we have lots of people in, in Bangladesh and in India, many Muslims in India, who support us. Many Christians support us, many Jews, many people from uh, the so-called Hindu faith that follow the Vedas, uh, uh, Taoists, many Buddhists. We have uh, one of our vice presidents is in Thailand, which is a Buddhist nation, and so on. So we're... Uh, uh, what we're doing appeals to people of every faith, and I think every faith has a vision of a different world, possible world, and some of them, like the Christians, say this is what Jesus was talking about, bringing the kingdom of God to earth means bringing the earth constitution to earth. Uh, and we're making coalitions with uh, with uh, many different groups. Um, uh, one of the ways the original organizers of WCPA before I, uh, uh, um, I got involved, uh, what they did was they, they contacted organizations. They were trying to build a network of organizations around the world that supported WCPA. And they had many, many organizations that uh, they, they actually had an employee, a paid employee that traveled to international conferences all over the world and he would uh, explain our work and sign up organizations. Uh, and, well, we lost that, that, those kind of resources and, those kind of, and that kind of funding in 2003 and since that time we haven't had been able to have a paid uh, person doing this. But, but nevertheless, we, we promote this wherever possible. Uh, this is the City Montessori School of uh, Lucknow, which has 50,000 students. Uh, every year they have an annual big conference. And we've been associated with them for a very long time because the director, uh, Jagdish Gandhi, uh, is one of our vice presidents. So he supports us and he hosts us when we come there, host conferences if we want to have conferences there, sessions of the Provisional World Parliament and so on. So we're, we're signing the peace candle, which is a ritual. Uh, it's, not, it, it's not a riot. It may look like a little bit of a riot. <laughs> these, are, these are reporters down here uh, taking pictures and so on. And uh, this, I like this photo because I, I've never really had a security detail before. <laughs> and uh, this, these, this group of young men were assigned to me and I couldn't, I couldn't go anywhere. I couldn't go out to the store, I couldn't go down the street without my security detail around me. And uh, this would be in Assam, India. Uh, and, uh, but the, uh, they're part of an organization called the People's Party International in India, which has hundreds of thousands of members. Uh, its uh, uh, leader is a, uh, a dynamic person named Bharat Gandhi, who, uh, ha who is affiliated with us, and we're, we're working directly with them. And uh, uh, this was, so I was at, uh, they have centers throughout India. And uh, this was one of their training centers in Assam, which is in the northeast part of India. Uh, and I watched them, I was there for a weekend watching them in their training. And they had 800 people from all over India being trained to promote People's Parties International. Right? And now we signed an official agreement with them that, that uh, People's Parties International would be part of a 
a world movement, right? And we're the main arm of that world movement while they're the arm in India and so on. So, hmm. so uh, same goal. It's amazing that here in India, you know, you might not find this in other countries, certainly not, never in the United States, but this People's Party is demanding world government. You know, they're saying, you know, we can't solve our problems in India unless there's a world government, unless we get rid of this militarism, we have peace in the world, then we can deal with our Indian problems as well. So, it's, uh, uh, these are the kind of things we're doing, uh, trying to find uh, parties to affiliate like, the, uh, like that one. Uh, then we're in the process of creating a world university online. Uh, we have uh, here in Virginia a nonprofit organization called the Institute on World Problems that works with WCPA. Laura's on the board of that uh, um, institute. And uh, uh, we're, we're uh, going to be offering courses online. Right? And courses. Uh, 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 and our instructor is Eugenia, who's out there, uh, just outside. There's, there's Eugenia, uh, she's done a lot of teaching, and she's also uh, quite, uh, has uh, educational experience in creating curricula for various levels of uh, students. And uh, one of the things we've done is uh, we've got uh, educational organizations in India who are asking for curricula for each grade level, uh, starting with the first, right up through the, uh, graduating from high school. And they want, they want us to give them materials that they can introduce to students that, that uh, depending on their level, that uh, show them the need for world government and uh, the Earth Constitution. So here's part two, the campaign for ratification, the Earth Federation. It's called the Earth Federation Movement. Uh, and uh, every chance we get, every place we get, and all the uh, people we're in contact with around the world, the number one goal has to be the pr movement toward ratifying this Constitution. And we saw yesterday that it's uh, Article 17 gives three stages by which this can be done. And uh, it, it specifies the concrete ways that this can be done. So there's a methodology there for making that happen under Article 17. And we, uh, so everybody that's connected with WCPA worldwide uh, is encouraged to understand that methodology, to uh, um, get signatories to the Earth Constitution, to promote the ratification of it. Uh, this uh, is uh, this is a, that uh, depiction of that card that's over there on the table. That on the one side of the card it gives ten values, and the argument is that these ten values: not a dialogue for mutual understanding, nonviolence, respecting human rights democratic laws, compassion and kindness, unity and diversity, justice making, sustainability, and global education, all of those values are not only there in the Earth Constitution, but they're only going to be successful worldwide. We only really have nonviolence worldwide, dialogue directed toward understanding worldwide, democratic laws worldwide if we ratify the Constitution. So they're all interconnected. Uh, and the reason why it's up here under the campaign for ratification is that we, it's cheap, right? It's cheap to make that card, much more expensive to make the brochure and so on. So everywhere we go, we hand that out to mass audiences, right? Even if I have 600 people in the audience, I have people handing this card out to everybody and so on. Uh, so it gets the word out, isn't it? And that's why this is a, was a mass audience that we had. I was not one of the speakers at it, but I, uh, we had a delegation there uh, in Tikwapaya, Bolivia, uh, last June. Uh, this was a conference on a world without borders and world citizenship. 
in direct response to the what the uh, so-called Elba countries of Latin America consider to be U.S. imperialism, which is just the opposite of world without borders and world citizenship. It's response to Trump's border wall and the U.S. interference with Venezuela, which is trying to create a democratic socialist order, and the U.S. says this is dangerous, we don't want this. And so uh, the uh, president of Bolivia, Evo Morales, called for, the, he invited the nations of Elba and the people of Latin America to this conference on the World Without Borders. There were thousands of people there. This, this auditorium was just packed with people, and they had, they had speakers who were presidents or past presidents of a number of Latin American countries, and people from Europe were there, every Latin American country had representation there, and so on. So we passed out hundreds and hundreds of those flyers to people, in, in, in Spanish, in, that case, in the case of this. So that's what we're doing, and it gives, uh, you know, it gives the, uh, on the back of this card, it gives uh, the basic uh, tenets of the Earth Constitution and the websites where people can go and sign up and so on. So there's, there's part two is over. <laughs> part, part three is, uh, as I mentioned uh, yesterday, Article 19, the last article of the Earth Constitution, gives us the right and the duty to start it now, right? To do it now. And this is, this is not something that's unprecedented in history, right? All the time, people, uh, when there's a conflict over who the government is, if you go back in history, you see this have many times, uh, the people who say this government that's now there is illegitimate, they start their own, right? And they get prominent people to come and they, say, they start organizing method, methods of making decisions and so on, democratic voting and the rest of it. And that's what, uh, that's what we're doing for the earth, right? The governments of the earth, I argue this, I've been arguing this for long time, and it's also in my new book, and I'm not the only um, philosopher that has argued this, the governments of the earth are not and cannot be legitimate any longer. Even if they were democratic, which the United States is not, it's run by an oligarchy of super rich, even if they were democratic, they cannot be legitimate if legitimacy is defined as serving the common good of their people. And that's in much democratic theory, going back to John Locke and the early theorists of democratic theory, that was what made government legitimate. Uh, Locke says unless government protects human rights and uh, uh, protects the population with uh, impartial judges and so on, it, it's not a legitimate government, and the people have the right and duty to overthrow it. That's what Thomas Jefferson put in the Declaration of Independence. Uh, and no government on earth is illegitimate, is legitimate any longer, because the common good of the planet, it, we're now aware, since the 20th century, includes peace and a protected planetary environment. The war system of the planet, uh, almost every single nation on earth is militarized, wasting their money and, and messing up the environment and detracting from our ability to save this planet from climate collapse. Right? And every uh, nation on the planet, even Costa Rica, which has no military, uh, cannot Costa Rica has 30% of its territory in protected areas because they're very environmentally conscious. But even if they were perfectly environmentally sustainable in Costa Rica, and they're not because they still use fossil fuel there, they, they can't uh, serve the common good of their people because the global environment is collapsing. 
And they're going, you know, everybody in Costa Rica is going to be suffering because everybody in the world is suffering because of this. So, so the, the common good has now shifted to the planet. Unless we have government that can, that can uh, uh, provide a common good for everyone on the planet, there's no one on the planet that's going to have their common good served. Their human rights served. So there's three generations of human rights. The first generation came from the 18th century, and that was our political rights to uh, assembly and freedom of speech and habeas corpus and uh, um, all these uh, political rights that are there in the first ten amendments of the uh, U.S. Constitution. The 19th century saw the development of the second generation of human rights, right? economic and social rights. Everyone has a right to health care. Everyone has a right to social security in the event of old age and so on. Everyone has a right to limited hours of work, to safe conditions of work. Right? All these things, everyone has a right to clean water and so on. These are the second generation rights that the socialists work so hard to get into uh, our consciousness and it has succeeded. The UN Declaration of human rights includes both those. It includes the, the political rights and it includes, for example, in Article 25, the right to Social Security, health care, uh, uh, education, all these rights are there in the UN Universal Declaration of Rights. But, but that was a document that came out in 1948 before the end of the 20th century, when all over the world people began to realize that we have a third generation of rights, which is the right to peace and the right to a sustainable environment that can support our lives. Without those, the other two generations of rights are worthless. So, so uh, provisional world government, right? We're in our understanding of what we're doing, this is more legitimate than any nation, than any existing government. Right? So we're, we're setting up government and we're saying that, the, you know, come look at this because this is your legitimate government for the world. This protects all three generations of your rights. No nation on earth can do that unless they join the Earth Federation, and when, in which case they become legitimate because then they're recognizing that there are global rights that everybody on the planet has. So, uh, it says we can form preparatory commissions to lay the groundwork for activating the Earth Constitution. We can begin sessions of the Provisional World Parliament. We've done that. We can commence the World Executive and begin activating the ministries of government. And I'll mention those, what we've done so far in a moment. Uh, today, we primarily activated the Provisional World Parliament and the Collegium of World Judges. And we've done that. Um, we've done that through World Legislative Acts. The Provisional World Parliament, first session of which was in 1982, at the uh, uh, big assembly uh, center in Brighton, England. Had people from all over the world there. And uh, um, since that time, we've held 14 sessions of the Vision of World Parliament. The next one is scheduled for a year and a half from now. Uh, so we passed World Legislative Act number 48 at the 12th session of the Parliament. And what it does is, you might remember from yesterday, we, Article 9 of the Constitution is about the world judges, the world court system. And uh, um, it calls for a collegium of world judges from which the benches of the world court will be activated. So we are, uh, we pass enabling legislation for the collegium of world judges through the provisional world parliament. And uh, this enabling legislation allows us to contact and organize and create a 
Provisional Collegium of World Judges. And we've been doing that for just a few years now, but we've got a number of prominent judges around the world who identify with the Earth Constitution, who are uh, signatories of it, who uh, are understand their role as a as a uh, collegium of highly qualified people from the high courts of the world who are there when we're ready to activate the first bench of the world supreme court system and uh, in the meantime of course they can be they can be educational for the world say why they're a collegium of world judges why we need a, a, a real world supreme court system there's no court on earth Right, that that is there for the world. Did, at the annual conference of the chief justices, how many nations are represented there? Uh, in recent ones, the they there's been 17 of them so far, and they started out with maybe 40 or 50 nations. Now they've got like 160 nations. Wow. That, I wanted, I wanted yeah. So they have like 210 think, yeah. judges come from 160 nations, and it's really impressive. And you typically combine efforts when you do your yeah. parliament with them. Help, help. Well, uh, what we do is we've had representation. I haven't been there every time. Eugenie has been there several times. I've been there a number of times. Uh, but we have WCPA members there every time, and we're talking with the judges every opportunity we get, uh, and uh, they they give me a chance to speak to the plenary session and so on, and and so I, I tr we try to get them interested in the Collegium of World Judges and the Earth Constitution. Um, this is uh, High Court Judge uh, uh, David Quispy from Lima, Peru, who is signing the Earth Constitution here, and uh, he's a member of the Collegium of World Judges, very active. So this, you know, this is a, uh, a work that we're doing. This is provisional world government, right? These, these are these are governmental. We've got a collegium of world judges waiting. And now, why is there no court? I think there's some, one thing that uh, it's important to interject here. Why is there no world court? Isn't there an international court of justice in The Hague? Isn't there an international criminal court now since 2002? There are, there is, right? Those entities are predicated on the system of sovereign nation states. The, you know, uh, after the Nuremberg trials, that was a, a watershed, right? As uh, David mentioned this, uh, um, uh, the chief prosecutor in the Nuremberg trials was a U.S. justice. And, you know, he, he famously said there is no, we have to have a world of law that replaces the world of force. And all these Nazi uh, uh, people that were on trial there said we're just obeying orders. That's what you do. You have a, you know.